familiar scenes of early morning and one that's not so familiar anymore. It was the echoing footsteps of the lamplighter that once aroused the town to each new day. In cape and cocked hat, a short ladder across his shoulder, he made his rounds every morning, blowing out the feeble flames he had lighted so faithfully the evening before. But the lamplighter was not the only one up with the sun. While his master sleeps, the slave boy, Cuffy, rises reluctantly from his pallet in the loft above the kitchen. Slowly the town begins to come to life as the early risers set about their daily chores. There's a well in almost every 18th century dooryard. The well house keeps trash, small animals, and small people from falling into the water. For most households in town, the well is their only source of water. Fortunately for coffee, people didn't bathe often. They thought bathing was unhealthy. Wood was plentiful in Virginia and throughout the American colonies. It was used for almost everything. Great quantities, of course, were burned for cooking and heating, especially in winter. This hay fork, fashioned entirely by hand, is held together by wooden pegs. The building is of wood, and so is the little piggin, which Sammy, the stable boy, uses to measure grain. The shovel, too, was made by hand from a solid block of wood. And the broom was another handicraft product. The manure from the stable, as well as that from the chicken house and the pigeon house, was carefully stored for use as fertilizer. Here old Quash, the coachman, leads out his favorite horse, Turk. Before drinking, Turk clears the surface of the watering trough, a hollowed out tree trunk. Sammy keeps the harness leather oiled and its metal parts bright. For Virginians have always loved fine horses, and in the 18th century, all who could afford it owned one or more. horses hooves improve their condition and of course their appearance. A horse deserved good care. He was man's best means of overland transport. Drawn by hand and heated in this fashion, hot water was not to be wasted. Lighting a fire with flint and steel called for both skill and patience. So, more often than not, a pan like this one was used to carry burning embers from one fire to start another. And this is the master's bedroom. And it would seem that he enjoys many of the advantages to which we today are accustomed. Hot water and, after a fashion, comfortable room temperatures the significant difference between that time and the present being that these services and comforts which today are provided by machines were in the 18th century among the duties of the slave. in the kitchen more than any other part of the house, we can examine the similarities and contrasts with present-day standards. Here, Bina the cook and coffee, without benefit of refrigeration, gas, electricity, or canned goods, perform the relatively toilsome chores involved in preparing meals for the family and the servants. 
Looking ahead to the midday dinner, Bina starts a roast. Lattices under the eaves reveal this little building to be the dairy house, the 18th century equivalent of our modern refrigerator. It was usually a separate building, as was the kitchen. A plastered attic and a brick floor well below ground level combined with the lattices to provide a cool storage place for dairy products. And from his bed, whose curtains protect him from drafts and the night air, the master rises. Christopher Kendall, prosperous cabinet maker of Williamsburg. He appears to appreciate the fire coffee has laid for him. And he accepts as a matter of course the hot water in the pewter basin on the washstand. The soap he uses is homemade. Each spring in most households, a quantity of lye, carefully made from wood ash, was boiled with animal fats to produce a crude, all-purpose soap. Christopher Kendall cleans his teeth with a frayed stick of sassafras root seems to serve very well for this purpose and the aromatic sassafras does have an extremely agreeable flavor. Today, except of course in barber shops, the ritual of softening the beard with brush and lather and then shaving with a straight razor has almost lost out to brushless and electric shaving. Among Christopher Kendall's most prized possessions are his razors, one for each day in the week. They were imported from England, of course, and with good care will outlast him and be passed on to a grandson. Indeed, most of the belongings of colonial Virginians were designed and made for both beauty and durability. Here, Bina's girl, Polly, gathers eggs for the morning meal. And Polly's big sister, Suki, feeds the chickens. Most households, even in town, were largely self-sustaining. Like Christopher Kendall's well-run home, they would have in back of the house, and not too far from the kitchen, a chicken house, vegetable garden, herb garden, orchard, paddock for the horses and cows, a dovecote, and perhaps even a pig pen. On her way to the kitchen, Polly meets Cuffy and goes with him to the smokehouse. No colonial Virginia household was complete without a small building in which to smoke and store its meat. The hams and sides of bacon hung from the smokehouse rafters, while a small fire of hickory chips smoldered steadily in the middle of the floor, preserving the meat and giving it a delicious flavor. So the children now have three essentials for breakfast, bacon, eggs, and a hearty appetite. With the roast now sizzling on the fire, Bina begins to fix breakfast, which will include, among other things, waffles. This is a traditional southern dish, here prepared in surroundings similar to those in which southern cooking gained its long-standing fame. Crude though conditions are, the whole ground flour, fresh eggs, raw milk, homemade butter, and Bina's magic touch may produce results such as elude a modern cook dependent on ready mixed products and the resources of cold storage. In the kitchen, too, there's further evidence of the abundance of wood in colonial Virginia, wooden tables and many wooden utensils, all of which absorbed grease and dirt and attracted insect pests of every kind. 
crumbs and food particles accumulated in the cracks and crevices. Wire mesh screens were rare, and flies passed freely through the open doors and windows. The simplest and most familiar of our sanitary facilities were then unknown. Such conditions, in combination with the slow pace of slave labor, which worked without most of the usual incentives, made cleanliness, judged by our modern standards, very hard to maintain. On the other hand, there were usually plenty of servants, and elbow grease has ever been the enemy of kitchen grease. Waffle irons have long handles so that Covey can use them without getting his hands burned. Judging by his skill at the task, this is not Covey's first day in the waffle department. There are fine distinctions in firewood and the embers they make. For Bina's purpose, beech wood makes the best coals. There are also distinctions in frying pans. Bina does not put the bacon into a skillet, but into a spider, which stands on its own three legs over whatever part of the fire Bina decides will give the right heat. Breakfast, of course, is the first problem, but with the day's other meals in view, Bina sets some pork and some black-eyed peas over the fire to boil. Coffee demonstrates that an open fire can do at least one thing that an electric toaster cannot, namely flavor the toast with wood smoke. Experience is Coffee's only guide to the right cooking time. Polly, who is absorbing this skill by watching and helping, appears at the proper time with a plate and bears the waffles off to the dining room. The usual practice was to roast and grind the coffee within a few hours of the time it was to be used. In this way, coffee's delicate aroma reached the drinker undiminished and without benefit of vacuum packing. Usually, a much longer time was required for roasting than we can show here. It's a delicate operation, and in the absence of thermostatic controls that automatically perform such services in our modern ovens, Success depended on the skill of the individual operator. A good example of the simple type of mechanical device just then coming into use was the coffee grinder. But muscles, not motors, provided the driving power. In the colonial household, many utensils, plates, bowls, pitchers, and so on, were made of pewter, an alloy of tin and copper. Articles of porcelain and earthenware broke too easily and were too difficult to replace. Eventually, however, these more sanitary materials did take the place of pewter when they became less expensive. be tempted by fresh eggs with firm, wholesome yolks such as these. Upstairs, the master of the household keeps pace with the advancing order of the day by completing his preparations for breakfast. And the stock he wears serves both as collar and tie and seems to be as efficient for that purpose as anything we have developed since. Christopher Kendall usually keeps his hair cut short to accommodate his wig, which is a small one. 
The term bigwig was applied to men whose sense of self-importance demanded that they wear a large wig, heavy and hot though it was. Next came the problem of getting the food from the fire to the dining room while it was still warm. Cuffy, for instance, has been trained to cover the platter carefully and to step lively as he carries it from the kitchen across the yard to the main house. The kitchen was a separate building to spare the family the heat and odors of cooking. Large families, generous hospitality, and plenty of wholesome food made the dining room an important part of the colonial home. Before the day of dry cleaning, a large napkin gave necessary protection to fine imported clothing or handmade homespun. Evidence of the influence of religion in colonial life was the custom of saying grace at every meal. Those who believe that the most delicate qualities of coffee are lost when it's boiled will be amused to know that when coffee was first introduced into the New World, some of the colonists are said to have eaten the boiled coffee beans and thrown the liquid away. Knives and spoons, of course, are prehistoric items, but the fork was introduced into the colonies during the 17th century. This means that the fingers were formerly used freely in eating, and it was perfectly polite to use the broad tip of the knife as a spoon. The queens wear china, the solid silver, and the fine linens show that prosperous colonists set store by high quality in all their possessions. Many of the manufactured articles were imported from England by the people of a colony devoted primarily to farming. Most of the food, however, except for the sugar, spices, and molasses, would be produced on the premises, even of a townhouse like this. These were the days when breaking the overnight fast was taken seriously in a big way. Dinner did not come until mid-afternoon, usually at two or three o'clock, but maybe not till four. So breakfast had to be a substantial meal. Milk and butter, which had been luxuries in the early days of the colony, were abundant during the 18th century. This drinking tumbler was made of horn with a silver base. The porcelain bowl from which little Philip eats his porridge was imported by sailing ship from China. colonies as in England. The eldest son of a craftsman usually learned his father's trade and in due time inherited the business. So it is with young Tom Kendall. Sister Lucy wants him to look his best as he starts off for his very first day in his father's cabinet making shop. When Philip gets old enough he too will probably enter a trade but it will not necessarily be cabinet making. As a younger son, Philip may be bound out to some other master craftsman for a term of perhaps seven years. In that time, he will get no pay for his services, but the master will feed and clothe him and see to his learning and good behavior. At the end of his apprenticeship, Philip will be a journeyman, free to move westward and set up shop for himself in some new community, while Tom stays in the old one. street, father and son leaving home for work together, perhaps no other scene could tell more of village life in colonial America.